Hi everyone. Um, in this video, we're going to be looking at the Brisbane City Council and Group Projects case. Okay, so this is um, the first of our frustration cases this week. And keep in mind that this case is actually referred to in Cadelpha. So if you watch this one before Cadelpha, it might make Cadelpha make a little bit more sense. Maybe. <laughs> okay, because they refer to it. But anyway. Okay. So what happened in this case? Um, in this case, group projects owned land on the outskirts of Brisbane and they wished to develop it. Um, and in this instance, Brisbane City Council agreed to apply to the minister to have the land rezoned. And the reason why they did this um, was they'd come to an agreement with group projects that group projects would provide a lot of the infrastructure um, costs for the development that um, and these infrastructure costs not just existing on that particular piece of land that was being rezoned. So, for example, they were going to provide water, sewerage. I think it was build a bridge as well, electricity, parks, footpaths, curbs, all that type of thing. Okay. Now, the government announced that they were going to be resuming part of the land to build a school, so taking back uh, the land, um, part of the land. Now... In the meantime, group projects lodged an objection to that and they told the council to continue with the uh, rezoning application. However, before the rezoning was approved, a month prior um, to the rezoning actually going through, uh, the government did indeed resume part of the land. Okay. And the issue that was before the court was with the group projects <laughs> uh, was obliged to continue to provide the services that were on the adjacent land or whether the contract was frustrated. So whether they had to build those footpaths and curbs and do the electricity, make the bridge, build the pipes. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court uh, said the contract was frustrated. That was then confirmed to the full court. And so um, the case made its way up to uh, the High Court. In terms of the outcome, the High Court was unanimous it was in um, denying the appeal. However, they, um, the decision was made on different grounds. So two judges dealt with the issue of frustration and the other judges decided um, the case on the basis um, of there having been a breach by counsel. Okay, but we'll, we won't be dealing with that one today. So in terms of the two judges that dealt with frustration, um, you can see that in the Stephen and Murphy judgment. Okay, judgments. Um. So having a look at the notes here on the slide, so um, performance didn't actually become impossible because the land was resumed because obviously the fact that the services weren't being put on that particular piece of land, it was in the surrounding area and it didn't become more costly or anything. So the, you know, the performance of that obligation to build the parks and stuff was exactly the same um, after the land had been resumed. However, uh, you know, on the true construction of the contract, looking to the purpose for which the parties contracted in the first place, Justice Stephen confirmed that it was all about, you know, development. Okay, so the purpose of the contract was for that land to be rezoned and developed. Now, the Justice Stephen test was to look at the contract and the situation contemplated by the parties at the time of entry into the contract and compared, and he compared that to um, the situation after the land was resumed. So when looking at the purpose, that was the comparison that was made. And the key question then became, uh, was performance radically different or did the change, did the resumption of the land render performance radically different from that which was contemplated? Okay, so the real emphasis there of Justice Stephen was on the purpose of the contract not on the nature of the obligations themselves, because no, as mentioned before, the obligations, building the parks, building the footpaths, didn't um, change at all, okay? Um, didn't become more expensive, didn't change at all. However, the purpose of the contract um, was enabled, in terms of development, was enabled to be fulfilled. All right, so if we have a look at our case reading guide questions then. Okay, so what did group projects promise um, Brisbane City Council it would do in return to fulfilment of what condition? Okay, so here group projects promise to pave roads, provide curbs, channels, footpaths, contribute to the cost of sewage, water mains, electricity, etc., as well as parks and the bridge. Okay, um, and it also promised to invest um, $120,000 into the council's issue of stock and bond. And what was the purpose of the bond? Um, on the basis that it's deed with group projects, provided that group projects above mentioned obligations, um, they were conditional upon their success 
of the application for rezoning actually being approved, okay, so from um, uh, the minister approving the rezoning. And Brisbane City Council argued that despite the land being resumed by the Crown, the approval was still provided. You know, it was provided, um, I think it was in the December, and the land had been resumed in the November. Okay, so it had been resumed. Yeah, so the approval was still provided, so they fulfilled their obligations. Um, so it didn't matter then that the land was no longer owned by group projects because they'd actually performed their side of the bargain. Um, so you can see um, discussion around that at 155. Okay. And so the second question there was performance of the deed rendered impossible by the resumption of the land by the Crown? Was it rendered more onerous? And as we've already discussed, um, and what the judgment says at, at 156, um, uh, it, it hasn't been rendered impossible or more onerous by the frustrating event, okay? Um, and in why, in what sense was it not more onerous? Um, in the sense that the bulk of the work contracting for was to be done off the acquired land, so it was still technically possible to do that work, okay? So the acquisition by the Crown didn't prevent the work or even alter its nature or costs. All of that stuff was fixed. Um, so you can see discussion that at 156. So in terms of what test of frustration does Justice Stephen propose, if you have a close look at um, uh, 160 and 161, okay, you can find the answer to this question. Um, Justice Stephen mentions Lord Reed's test from the Davis contractors case, okay. Um, in that case, it was stated that frustration is the termination of the contract um, by operation of law on the emergence of a, this is very important, fundamentally different situation, okay. Um, and also um, Lord Radcliffe um, suggested in that case that frustration occurs whenever, wherever the law recognises that without default of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken. In this case... Um, Justice Stephen read those two um, tests together, so Lord Radcliffe and Lord Reed's tests together, um, and said that they represented the approach he'd take in the present case, which eventually, obviously, in looking at the purpose of the contract as relevance, so it's not just whether the obligation itself has changed, it's whether um, that radical difference can be shown through the purpose by which the parties entered the contract. So in terms of the test for frustration, um, then does Justice Stephen suggest that this is a precise formula? Uh, no, does not. Okay, at 162, he says that, and this is a direct quote, um, it is true that the various expositions of the true basis of the doctrine of frustration leave imprecise in its operation um, when applied to particular cases. Okay. There's some imprecision there. He doesn't seem particularly troubled by this. Um, and, oh, no, hang on. I take that back. He does seem troubled. <laughs> oh, I'm having a shocker today. He does seem troubled, okay. Um, he questions how one is to decide how dramatic um, uh, the impact of an allegedly frustrating event um, must be and to what extent must such an event overturn expectations or affect the foundation on which the parties um, contracted? Okay, so we use trouble about it, by, but he does note that there is some imprecision as to how it applies um, to particular cases. But note that what's imprecise to some is potentially, you know, just a really great flexible, you know, approach for others. So, yeah, imprecision is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, if you're too prescriptive, you might leave out a case which is potentially um, one like this where the obligations haven't particularly changed, but it really did become something very different um, because of this supervening event. So in terms of question four then, so in your own words, so why were the deed, the bond, the mortgage frustrated by the resumption of land by the Crown? Um, we already touched upon this at the start of um, the talk we just wanted you to really look at here uh, the contract's purpose so here acquisition of the land wholly destroyed group projects purpose in undertaking any obligations at all okay the whole point of doing the curbs and the bridge I just love the bridge 
<laughs> um, the whole point of doing this great bridge and the parks and the curves and the footpaths, etc., um, was because they wanted to develop that particular land. So the two things were very much tied. So, okay, so there's a little factual scenario there for you. So group projects um, agreed. So assuming that group projects agreed to purchase the land from the owner, completion of the purchase was expressly subject to approval of group projects' um, plan of subdivision. Before completion, the Crown announced its intention to resume the land as of a date after the contractual date of settlement. Would this announcement excuse group projects from having to complete the contract? So this scenario here is really just asking you um, whether it would make any difference if group projects were to suffer a resumption of their land by the Crown after the project is completed. Um, so it's just, you know, essentially asking you whether frustration applies retrospectively. Um, and here, you know, the no argument would be that you can't frustrate a contract once it's been discharged. Okay, so once a contract's done, contract's over, no supervening event will change anything because it's completed. Okay, uh, all right. So that's the BCC and group projects case, which we will touch on briefly when we look at Kidelfa.